Chapter 5 Seven Dials We have always been of the opinion that if Tom King and the Frenchman had not immortalized Seven Dials, Seven Dials would have immortalized itself. Seven Dials, the region of song and poetry, first effusions and last dying speeches, hollowed by the names of Katnick and of Pitts, names that will entwine themselves with costermongers and barrel organs, when penny magazines shall have superseded penny yards of song, and capital punishment be unknown. Look at the construction of the place. The Gordian Knot was all very well in its way. So was the maze of Hampton Court. So was the maze at the Beulah Spa. So were the ties of stiff white neckcloths, when the difficulty of getting one on was only to be equaled by the apparent impossibility of ever getting it off again. But what involutions can compare with those of seven dials? Where is there such another maze of streets, courts, lanes, and alleys? Where such a pure mixture of Englishmen and Irishmen as in this complicated part of London? We boldly aver that we doubt the veracity of the legend to which we have averted. We can suppose a man rash enough to inquire at random, at a house with lodgers too, for Mr. Thompson with all but the certainty before his eyes of finding at least two or three Thompsons in any house of moderate dimensions. But a Frenchman, a Frenchman in seven dials, pooh, he was an Irishman. Tom King's education had been neglected in his infancy, and as he couldn't understand half the man said, he took it for granted he was talking French. The stranger who finds himself in the dials for the first time and stands Belzoni-like at the entrance of seven obscure passages, uncertain which to take, will see enough around him to keep his curiosity and attention awake for no inconsiderable time. From the irregular square into which he has plunged, the streets and courts dart in all directions until they are lost in the unwholesome vapor which hangs over the housetops and renders the dirty perspective uncertain and confined and lounging at every corner, as if they came there to take a few gasps of such fresh air as has found its way so far, but is too much exhausted already to be enabled to force itself into the narrow alleys around, are groups of people whose appearance and dwellings would fill any mind but a regular Londoner's with astonishment. On one side, a little crowd has collected around a couple of ladies, who, having imbibed the contents of various three-outs of gin and bitters in the course of the morning, have at length differed on some point of domestic arrangement, and are on the eve of settling the quarrel satisfactorily by an appeal to blows, greatly to the interest of other ladies who live in the same house, and tenements adjoining, and who are all partisans on one side or the other. "'Why don't you pitch into her, Sarah?' exclaims one half-dressed matron, by way of encouragement. "'Why don't you? If my husband had treated her with a drain last night, unbeknownst to me, I'd tear her precious eyes out. A wixen!' "'What's the matter, ma'am?' inquires another old woman, who has just bustled up to the spot. "'Matter?' replies the first speaker, talking at the obnoxious combatant. "'Matter? Here's poor dear Mrs. Sullivan, as has five blessed children of her own, can't go out a charred for one afternoon, but what hussies must be a-coming and tysing away her own husband, as she's been married to twelve year come next Easter Monday, for I see the certificate when I was a-drinking a cup of tea with her, only the very last blessed Wednesday as ever was sent. I happen to say promiscuously, Mrs. Sullivan, says I, What do you mean by hussies? interrupts a champion of the other party, who has evinced a strong inclination throughout to get up a branch fight on her own account. Hurroar! ejaculates a potboy in parentheses. Put the kibosk on her, Mary. What do you mean by hussies? reiterates the champion. Never mind, replies the opposition expressively. Never mind, you go home, and when you're quite sober, mend your stockings. This somewhat personal allusion, not only to the lady's habits of intemperance, but also to the state of her wardrobe, rouses her utmost ire, and she accordingly complies with the urgent request of the bystanders to pitch in with considerable alacrity. The scuffle became general, and terminates in minor playbill phraseology with arrival of the policeman, interior of the station house, and impressive denouement. In addition to the numerous groups who are idling about the gin shops and squabbling in the center of the road, 
Every post in the open space has its occupant, who leans against it for hours with listless perseverance. It is odd enough that one class of men in London appear to have no enjoyment beyond leaning against posts. We never saw a regular bricklayer's laborer take any other recreation, fighting excepted. Pass through St. Giles's in the evening of a weekday, there they are in their fustian dresses, spotted with brick dust and whitewash, leaning against posts. Walk through Seven Dials on Sunday morning, there they are again, drab or light corduroy trousers, blucher boots, blue coats, and great yellow waistcoats, leaning against posts. The idea of a man dressing himself in his best clothes, to lean against a post all day. The peculiar character of these streets, and the close resemblance each one bears to its neighbor, by no means tends to decrease the bewilderment in which the unexperienced wayfarer through the dials finds himself involved. He traverses streets of dirty, straggling houses, with now and then an unexpected court composed of buildings as ill-proportioned and deformed as the half-naked children that wallow in the kennels. Here and there, a little dark chandler shop, with a cracked bell hung up behind the door to announce the entrance of a customer, or betray the presence of some young gentleman in whom a passion for shop tills has developed itself at an early age. Others, as if for support, against some handsome lofty building which usurps the place of a low, dingy public house. Long rows of broken and patched windows expose plants that may have flourished when the dials were built, in vessels as dirty as the dials themselves. In shops for the purchase of rags, bones, old iron, and kitchen stuff, vie in cleanliness with the bird fanciers and rabbit dealers, which one might fancy so many arcs, but for the irresistible conviction that no bird in its proper senses, who was permitted to leave one of them, would ever come back again. Broker shops, which would seem to have been established by humane individuals as refuges for destitute bugs, interspersed with announcements of day schools, penny theaters, petition writers, mangles, and music for balls or routs, complete with the still life of the subject. And dirty men, filthy women, squalid children, fluttering shuttlecocks, noisy battle doors, reeking pipes, bad fruit, more than doubtful oysters, attenuated cats, depressed dogs, and anatomical fowls are its cheerful accompaniments. If the external appearance of the houses, or a glance at their inhabitants, present but few attractions, a closer acquaintance with either is little calculated to alter one's first impression. Every room has its separate tenant, and every tenant is, by the same mysterious dispensation, which causes a country curate to increase and multiply most marvelously, generally the head of a numerous family. The man in the shop, perhaps, is in the baked jimmy line, or the firewood and hearthstone line, or any other line which requires a floating capital of 18 pence or thereabouts. And he and his family live in the shop, in the small back parlor behind it. Then there is an Irish laborer, and his family in the back kitchen, and a jobbing man, carpet beater and so forth, with his family in the front one. In the front one pair, there's another man with another wife and family, and in the back one pair, there's a young woman as takes in tambo work and dresses quite genteel, who talks a good deal about my friend and can't abear anything low. The second floor front and the rest of the lodgers are just a second edition of the people below, except a shabby genteel man in the back attic who has his half pint of coffee every morning from the coffee shop next door but one, which boasts a little front den called a coffee room with a fireplace over which is an inscription politely requesting that to prevent mistakes, customers will please to pay on delivery. The shabby genteel man is an object of some mystery, but as he leads a life of seclusion, and never was known to buy anything beyond an occasional pin, except half pints of coffee, penny loaves, and hayperths of ink, his fellow lodgers very naturally suppose him to be an author, and rumors are current in the dials that he writes poems for Mr. Warren. Now, anybody who passed through the dials on a hot summer's evening and saw the different women of the house gossiping on the steps would be apt to think that all was harmony among them and that a more primitive set of people than the native dialers could not be imagined. Alas, the man in the shop ill-treats his family, the carpet-beater extends his professional pursuits to his wife, 
The one pair front has an undying feud with the two pair front. In consequence of the two pair front persisting in dancing over his, the one pair front's head, when he and his family have retired for the night. The two pair back will interfere with the front kitchen's children. The Irishman comes home drunk every other night and attacks everybody. And the one pair back screams at everything. Animosities spring up between floor and floor. The very seller asserts his equality. Mrs. A smacks Mrs. B's child for making faces. Mrs. B forthwith throws cold water over Mrs. A's child for calling names. The husbands are embroiled. The quarrel becomes general. An assault is the consequence. And a police officer, the result. Chapter 6 Meditations in Monmouth Street we have always entertained a particular attachment towards Monmouth Street as the only true and real emporium for second-hand wearing apparel. Monmouth Street is venerable from its antiquity and respectable from its usefulness. Hollywell Street we despise. The red-headed and red-whiskered Jews who forcibly haul you into their squalid houses and thrust you into a suit of clothes whether you will or not, we detest. The inhabitants of Monmouth Street are a distinct class, a peaceable and retiring race who immure themselves for the most part in deep cellars or small back parlors, and who seldom come forth into the world except in the dusk and coolness of the evening when they may be seen seated in chairs on the pavement smoking their pipes or watching the gambols of their engaging children as they revel in the gutter, a happy troop of infantine scavengers. Their countenances bear a thoughtful and dirty cast, certain indications of their love of traffic, and their habitations are distinguished by that disregard of outward appearance and neglect of personal comfort so common among people who are constantly immersed in profound speculations and deeply engaged in sedentary pursuits. We have hinted at the antiquity of our favorite spot. A Monmouth Street-laced coat was a byword a century ago. And still we find Monmouth Street the same. Pilot greatcoats with wooden buttons have usurped the place of the ponderous laced coat with full skirts. Embroidered waistcoats with large flaps have yielded to the double-breasted checks with roll collars, and three-cornered hats of quaint appearance have given place to the low crowns and broad brims of the coachman school. But it is the times that have changed, not Monmouth Street. Through every alteration and every change, Monmouth Street has still remained the burial place of the fashions, and such, to judge from all present appearances, it will remain until there are no more fashions to bury. We love to walk among these extensive groves of the illustrious dead, and to indulge in the speculations to which they give rise, now feeding a deceased coat, then a dead pair of trousers, and anon the mortal remains of a gaudy waistcoat upon some being of our own conjuring up and endeavoring, from the shape and fashion of the garment itself, to bring its former owner before our mind's eye. We have gone on speculating in this way, until whole rows of coats have started from their pegs and buttoned up of their own accord round the waists of imaginary wearers. Lions of trousers have jumped down to meet them. Waistcoats have almost burst with anxiety to put themselves on. And half an acre of shoes have suddenly found feet to fit them, and gone stumping down the street with a noise which has fairly awakened us from our pleasant reverie, and driven us slowly away with a bewildered stare, an object of astonishment to the good people of Monmouth Street, and of no slight suspicion to the policeman at the opposite street corner. We were occupied in this manner the other day, endeavoring to fit a pair of lace-up half-boots on an ideal personage, for whom, to say the truth, they were full a couple of sizes too small, when our eyes happened to alight on a few suits of clothes ranged outside the shop window, which it immediately struck us, must at different periods have all belonged to and been worn by the same individual, and had now, by one of those strange conjunctions of circumstances which will occur sometimes, come to be exposed together for sale in the same shop. The idea seemed a fantastic one, and we looked at the clothes again with a firm determination not to be easily led away. No, we were right. The more we looked, the more we were convinced of the accuracy of our previous impression. There was the man's whole life written as legibly on those clothes 
as if we had his autobiography engrossed on parchment before us. The first was a patched and much soiled skeleton suit, one of those straight blue cloth cases in which small boys used to be confined before belts and tunics had come in and old notions had gone out. An ingenious contrivance for displaying the full symmetry of a boy's figure, by fastening him into a very tight jacket, with an ornamental row of buttons over each shoulder, and then buttoning his trousers over it, so as to give his legs the appearance of being hooked on just under the armpits. This was the boy's dress. It had belonged to a town boy, we could see. There was a shortness about the legs and arms of the suit, and a bagging about the knees, peculiar to the rising youth of London streets. A small day school he had been at, evidently. If it had been a regular boys' school, they wouldn't have let him play on the floor so much, and rub his knees so white. He had an indulgent mother, too, and plenty of halfpence, as the numerous smears of some sticky substance about the pockets and just below the chin, which even the salesman's skill could not succeed in disguising, sufficiently betokened. They were decent people, but not overburdened with riches, or he would not have so far outgrown the suit when he passed into those corduroys with a round jacket, in which he went to a boy's school, however, and learnt to write, and an ink of pretty tolerable blackness, too, if the place where he used to wipe his pen might be taken as evidence. A black suit and the jacket changed into a diminutive coat. His father had died, and the mother had got the boy a message lad's place in some office. A long-worn suit, that one, rusty and threadbare before it was laid aside, but clean and free from soil to the last. Poor woman. We could imagine her assumed cheerfulness over the scanty meal, and the refusal of her own small portion that her hungry boy might have enough. Her constant anxiety for his welfare, her pride in his growth mingled sometimes with the thought, almost too acute to bear, that as he grew to be a man, his old affection might cool, old kindnesses fade from his mind, and old promises be forgotten. The sharp pain that even then a careless word or cold look would give her, all crowded on our thoughts as vividly as if the very scene were passing before us. These things happen every hour, and we all know it, and yet we felt as much sorrow when we saw, or fancied we saw, it makes no difference which, the change that began to take place now, as if we had just conceived the bare possibility of such a thing for the first time. The next suit, smart but slovenly, meant to be gay, and yet not half so decent as the threadbare apparel, Regulant of the idle lounge and the blackguard companions told us, we thought, that the widow's comfort had rapidly faded away. We could imagine that coat. Imagine. We could see it. We had seen it a hundred times, sauntering in company with three or four other coats of the same cut above some place of profligate resort at night. We dressed from the same shop window in an instant half a dozen boys of from fifteen to twenty, and putting cigars into their mouths and their hands into their pockets, watched them as they sauntered down the street and lingered at the corner with the obscene jest and the oft-repeated oath. We never lost sight of them till they had cocked their hats a little more on one side and swaggered into the public house, and when we entered the desolate home where the mother sat late in the night alone, we watched her as she paced the room in feverish anxiety, and every now and then opened the door, looked wistfully into the dark and empty street, and again returned to be again and again disappointed. We beheld the look of patience with which she bore the brutish threat, nay, even the drunken blow, and we heard the agony of tears that gushed from her very heart as she sank upon her knees in her solitary and wretched apartment. A long period had elapsed, and a greater change had taken place by the time of casting off the suit that hung above. It was that of a stout, broad-shouldered, sturdy-chested man, and we knew at once, as anybody would who glanced at that broad-skirted green coat with the large metal buttons, that its wearer seldom walked forth without a dog at his heels and some idle ruffian, the very counterpart of himself, at his side. The vices of the boy had grown with the man, and we fancied his home then, if such a place deserves the name. We saw the bare and miserable room, destitute of furniture, crowded with his wife and children, pale, hungry, and emaciated, the man cursing their lamentations, staggering to the tap room from whence he had just returned, followed by his wife and sickly infant, clamoring for bread. 
and heard the street wrangle and noisy recrimination that his striking her occasioned. And then imagination led us to some metropolitan workhouse, situated in the midst of crowded streets and alleys, filled with noxious vapors and ringing with boisterous cries, where an old and feeble woman, imploring pardon for her son, lay dying in a close, dark room, with no child to clasp her hand, and no pure air from heaven to fan her brow. A stranger closed the eyes that settled into a cold, unmeaning glare, and strange ears received the words that murmured from the white and half-closed lips. A coarse round frock, with a worn cotton neckerchief and other articles of clothing of the commonest description, completed the history. A prison and the sentence, banishment or the gallows. What would the man have given then, to be once again the contented, humble drudge of his boyish years, to have been restored to life but for a week, a day, an hour, a minute, only for so long a time as would enable him to say one word of passionate regret to, and hear one sound of heartfelt forgiveness from, the cold and ghastly form that lay rotting in the pauper's grave, the children wild in the streets, the mother a destitute widow, both deeply tainted with the deep disgrace of the husband and father's name, and impelled by sheer necessity down the precipice that had led him to a lingering death, possibly of many years' duration, thousands of miles away. We had no clue to the end of the tale, but it was easy to guess its termination. We took a step or two further on, and by way of restoring the naturally cheerful tone of our thoughts, began fitting visionary feet and legs into a cellar board full of boots and shoes, with a speed and accuracy that would have astonished the most expert artist in leather living. There was one pair of boots in particular, a jolly, good-tempered, hardy-looking pair of tops, that excited our warmest regard, and we had got a fine, red-faced, jovial fellow of a market gardener into them before we had made their acquaintance half a minute. They were just the very thing for him. There was his huge, fat legs bulging over the tops, and fitting them too tight to admit of his tucking in the loops he had pulled them on by, and his knee cords with an interval of stocking, and his blue apron tucked up round his waist, and his red neckerchief and blue coat, and a white hat stuck on one side of his head. And there he stood with a broad grin on his great red face, whistling away, as if any other idea but that of being happy and comfortable had never entered his brain. This was the very man after our own heart. We knew all about him. We had seen him coming up to Convent Garden in his green chase cart with a fat, tubby little horse half a thousand times. And even while we cast an affectionate look upon his boots, at that instant, the form of a coquettish servant maid suddenly sprung into a pair of Denmark satin shoes that stood beside them, and we at once recognized the very girl who accepted his offer of a ride just on this side the Hammersmith suspension bridge the very last Tuesday morning we rode into town from Richmond. A very smart female, in a showy bonnet, stepped into a pair of gray cloth boots, with black fringe and binding, that were studiously pointing out their toes on the other side of the top boots, and seemed very anxious to engage his attention. But we didn't observe that our friend the market gardener appeared at all captivated with these blandishments, for, beyond giving a knowing wink when they first began, as if to imply he quite understood their end and object, he took no further notice of them. His indifference, however, was amply recompensed by the excessive gallantry of a very old gentleman with a silver-headed stick, who tottered into a pair of large list shoes that were standing in one corner of the board, and indulged in a variety of gestures expressive of his admiration of the lady in the cloth boots, to the immeasurable amusement of a young fellow we put into a pair of long-quartered pumps, who we thought would have split the coat that slid down to meet him, with laughing. We had been looking on at this little pantomime with great satisfaction for some time, when, to our unspeakable astonishment, we perceived that the whole of the characters, including a numerous corps de ballet of boots and shoes in the background, into which we had been hastily thrusting as many feet as we could press into the service, were arranging themselves in order for dancing. And some music striking up at the moment, to it they went without delay. It was perfectly delightful to witness the agility of the market gardener, out went the boots, first on one side, then on the other, then cutting, then shuffling, then setting to the Denmark satins, then advancing, then retreating, then going round and then repeating the whole of the evolutions again, without appearing to suffer in the least from the violence of the exercise. Nor were the Denmark satins a bit behindhand, for they jumped and bounded about in all directions, and though they were neither so regular, 
nor so true to the time as the cloth boots. Still, as they seem to do it from the heart, and to enjoy it more, we candidly confess that we preferred their style of dancing to the other. But the old gentleman in the list shoes was the most amusing object in the whole party. For, besides his grotesque attempts to appear youthful and amorous, which were sufficiently entertaining in themselves, the young fellow in the pumps managed so artfully that every time the old gentleman advanced to salute the lady in the cloth boots, he trod with his whole weight on the old fellow's toes, which made him roar with anguish and rendered all the others like to die of laughing. We were in the full enjoyment of these festivities when we heard a shrill and by no means musical voice exclaim, Oh, you'll know me again, and Prince! And on looking intently forward to see from whence the sound came, we found that it proceeded, not from the young lady in the cloth boots, as we had at first been inclined to suppose, but from a bulky lady of elderly appearance, who was seated in a chair at the head of the cellar steps, apparently for the purpose of superintending the sale of the articles arranged there. A barrel organ, which had been in full force close behind us, ceased playing. The people we had been fitting into the shoes and boots took to flight at the interruption, and as we were conscious that in the depth of our meditations we might have been rudely staring at the old lady for half an hour without knowing it, we took to flight too, and were soon immersed in the deepest obscurity of the adjacent dials.